take a sprint at this one tonight. We're going to take a sprint through. Um, but uh, it really does. It jumps off the page at us. It's wonderful, of course, as ever, to speak of good King Hezekiah. Um, you know, we don't find too many of those good kings in the uh, kings of Israel and Jews, but Hezekiah was one of them. And so tonight, uh, really, what I want to do, actually, I'm going to just open this evening. We're reading the last two verses of chapter number 31. The last two verses of chapter 31 and the first two verses of chapter number 32. The rest of the verses we will read as we go through the message because there's quite a few verses in there that I want to look at this evening. But I just want to set the tone, set the contrast, set the scene a little bit in case you're not familiar with this. And then we can unpack that just a little bit by way of introduction. So Second Chronicles chapter 31, we'll read verses 20 and 21. And then we'll jump down into chapter 32 and we'll read verses 1 and 2. And then we'll see what the Lord has for us this evening. The word of God says, And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah, and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God. And every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. Let me jump into chapter 32. After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and encamped against the bent cities and thought to win them for himself. Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem. I will read verse 3. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. We'll end our reading there, but that isn't the end of our reading for the chapter there this evening. But just Set a little bit of a scene. Well, I'll give you the title, we'll pray, and I'll come back and give you some introduction, and then we'll go through it. The thought tonight, the title of this evening's message is, Revival Will Bring You Through Trial. Revival Will Bring You Through Trial. Now, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us and lead us tonight. Our Father, we come before you, we bow our heads before your throne of grace. We submit ourselves to your heavenly, holy word before us, and our Lord, we ask you to guide and lead by your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we look through this... Uh, Passage of Scripture, we pray that, Lord, this is not just a lesson in history. This is not just of some historical antiquity interest to us. But, Lord, did you will give us something that will help us this day. Lord, these good people have come out this evening to hear from you. Lord, they want to be fed. They want to be fed from your word and our God. They want something that's going to help them this week to glorify Jesus Christ in lives. Father, to strengthen us, to, to comfort us. These are indeed difficult days and times. We live in this present evil world, but we are to shine as light. So our Heavenly Father, help us to understand the power of personal and corporate revival. Lord, it will take us through times of trial and trouble in this world, that we may give glory, honor, and praise unto Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 So again, this is more of a message for the saved. If you're in here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, then I, I hope the Lord will speak to your heart as well. And don't leave this place if you're not saved tonight. You're not converted. You're not born again. You're not a Christian. We find from the Scriptures and leave you in no doubt how you can know Christ as your Savior today. But I know certainly most of you are without doubt saved here this evening, and you give good testimony to that. And I want us to think on the thought because we we we're not. We're not sailing to heaven on, 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 on the good cruise ship Christianity. We're not going to heaven on flowery beds of ease. These indeed are becoming more and more difficult times, whether you're in the workplace, the school place, you know, the, uh, the local place where you live. As much as we're reaching out with the gospel, to those who live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us we shall suffer persecution. Now, don't misunderstand me for a minute. I know a lot of Christians talk about persecution. We don't know the meaning of persecution yet in this country. We know it from Christian history, but our brothers and sisters around the world are being persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, losing families, losing livelihoods, losing their freedom and liberty, some of them still losing their lives. You know, we, we think we're being persecuted because somebody says they don't like us because we talk of the Lord Jesus Christ or mock us, ridicule, revile or reject us. That's not persecution. But nonetheless, it is a trial, isn't it? And it can be a trial and it can be relentless. 
You know, that doesn't matter whether you're just on the high street giving out some tracks and preaching and getting some white rappers bounced off your head or having a barrage of expletives, or whether in your workplace and you've identified yourself as a Christian and it's a place that has become particularly hostile to you. You know, these things are trying. They do try us, you know, but tribulation work of patience and patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed for the love of God is shed abroad in our, uh, by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. So these things are important, but... What we will see in this order is we need to place some emphasis on the things that bring revival to us personally, corporately, as a church. I would say nationally, but nationally as Christians. But, of course, you can't revive what isn't vived. Revival isn't for the unsaved, but it is for the saved. And may the Lord help us to be so. Now, when we just finished out at chapter number 31... We're not going to read through it all, but let me just give you a couple of points from there. Hezekiah, good king of Israel, and he comes in and he wants to break down and cut down the groves, the high places, the Baalites worship, the false worship, the idolatry that had been prominent so often in, in both Israel and Judah. You know, we hear of the kings and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But Hezekiah comes in, the start of 31, he's breaking down the images, cutting down the groves, um, appointing the courses of the priests, setting things in order in the temple, he's reorganizing, restoring, reviving the true, true worship of the true God in the temple, the very central place for the national worship of the Old Testament, uh, worship of, of God by the nation of Israel. He then we find the people were coming and they were given. Verse number five of chapter 31 says, As soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and of the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. The end of verse six tells us they laid them by heaps. Uh, verse 14 tells us the pre free will offerings were, 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 were pouring in. So you've got the tithe coming in. They're piling all that up. The free will offerings are coming in. They're piling all that up. The priests are being organized by the course. They're sanctifying and separating themselves to the Lord. Israel is getting right with God. Israel is repenting of its sinful state. Israel is giving what it should do of its first fruits to the Lord and then putting some more offerings by free will on top. The people were being revived. The true worship was being revived. God's people were doing what they hadn't been doing, and it was just abundant time of blessing. And Hezekiah, as the leader, the king of the nation, was leading forth the charge. He was leading. The, the mighty men of valor were following. The priests were following the instruction. The nation was following, and there was incredible revival in Judah. And that's where we just finished out chapter number 31. He did it with all his heart and prosper. His whole heart mind, body, and soul. He was loving the Lord his God with all his mind, spirit, body, and strength. Everything was going into pleasing the Lord his God, and the people were prospering. Everything was going well. They were honoring God. They were being obedient to God, and then the reward for that was invasion by opposing armies hostile to God's people. Now, this comes off the back, really, of the message uh, Ross was preaching this morning, wasn't he? You know, this, 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 this faith that had begun in the widow was then a faith tested. Hezekiah, the priest and the nation, for, for, for one of the rare occasions in the, in the time of the history of the nation of Judah, was doing everything right and pleasing God, doing it with all their heart, prospering. And then the enemies of God's people encamped and encircled. You see... When we do right by the Lord and we do the right thing, it doesn't mean that we then float to heaven in the lives of prosperity. We've never found that pattern in the scriptures. You see, a faith that's not challenged and a faith that's not tested is a faith that's not displayed. You know, the, the, the tea bag only gives its flavor when you put it in the hot water. And so it is with Christians. We're not truly displaying who we are. We're not shining as lights in this world because, you know what? A light can't shine in light. A light shines in what? Darkness. And if we're to shine in lights as lights in this world, Galatians 1 tells us, uh, Galatians 1, 4, that we're in this present evil world and we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of, of Christ, if you will, and then we are to shine as lights and we will find... A pattern very often the case. 
You come to a position of repentance and then revival in your life. You start getting things right with the Lord. You start getting things right in your life. You get the order right. You're tithing. You're giving. You're coming to church. Everything's in order. All the junk is being cut down and cast over your life. You're getting right with God. That's a personal revival. And then all of a sudden, you're doing it with all your heart, praising the Lord. And then you look out and your enemies are encircled around you. And you look out and you think, wow, where did this come from? That's the introduction of what we see here tonight. Revival will bring you through trial, firstly, because it will give you resourcefulness. Look with me again at the text now in chapter 32 as we read verses 3 to 8. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the water, the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Now, we could read much more there, but let me just stop and we will read much more. Don't cast your pearls before swine, the Lord Jesus Christ said. He says, they can come and invite us all they like, but the water that's flowing through Jerusalem and Judah, we're not going to feed our enemies with the water who come against us. We're not going to give them the good of the fruit of God's land to enable them to be strengthened to come against us. We need to be very careful. Where do we commit our resources? Where do we commit our time? Where do we get our talent? Where do we commit our treasure? Are we enabling the enemies of God's people? Are we giving all of our best to those who would come and subdue the church, who would stand against Christ and against his people? Yes, we, we withhold the gospel from no one, no one. The water, the life-giving truth of the gospel must be given out, but God's precious resources that he gives to his people, we ought to be very careful about who we enable and empower with the things that God has given us for our stewards. It's just, it's just a throwaway thought there. Uh, come back with me to um, verse then number five. Also, speaking of Hezekiah, he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields and spears and shields in abundance set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We see this resourcefulness that comes from revival. The nation had been revived. The king had been revived. The priest had been revived. The people had been revived. They were looking to their God and they looked out one day and they saw enemies in multitude. They looked out and they saw this is an overwhelming display of shock and awe and force coming against us, against God's people. We've just been doing the right thing. The first thing we see the resourcefulness that God gives to his people in times of trial when we've been revived is Take counsel before we act. It's a great word to, to God's people. We should take some counsel. The king took counsel with his princes and his mighty men. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there are so many things we do based on our emotions and based instantly. And, and here is a position where they are facing an overwhelming force. You know, simply by statistics, they were about to be annihilated and overcome. But Hezekiah didn't react and he didn't respond. He went and took counsel with his princes and his mighty men, brothers and sisters in Christ, men to men, ladies to ladies. Take counsel with the decisions in your life. Some, sometimes you can't. I know sometimes you've got to take decisions on the hoof, if, if you will, but always make sure you commit them in prayer to the Lord before you do. But wherever you can, one of the greatest uh, things sometimes that are, are, are disappointing to me as a pastor is I usually get the second layer of counsel. Where somebody says, I've done this and this happened, what should I do now? And my advice is you shouldn't have done what you did in the first time. But you didn't ask me about that, right? It's that. Uh, 
It says, so often as Christians, we respond in the flesh. We do not take counsel from the Lord or from those around you, the princes and the mighty men of valor in your life, the, the women of God, the men of God, the people to whom you can say, I'm, I'm going to take some counsel. There's, you know, there's wisdom in many counselors, Proverbs says. They've got to be the right kind of counselors. But the resourcefulness came from the counsel that Hezekiah took. The revival had come about. And the first thing he did, he said, I know there's men around me who are godly men and mighty men of valor, and I can take some counsel from them. And after the counsel, the resourcefulness, he was given the resource of courage. And we see this. Now, I'm going to give you a definition of courage. Uh, a pastor friend of mine recently uh, gave this definition, and I thought it was a good one and worthy of repeating. Courage, the quality of being brave, the ability to face danger, difficulty, uncertainty, or, or pain without being overcome by fear or being deflected from a chosen course of action. You see, that's when we need courage to stay on course. We need courage to stay on track. We can take counsel, we can make the decisions, but when we face the oppositions, the trials and the tribulations that this world throws against us, we need courage to stay on track, to stay on that chosen course. God did not give us what? The spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7 tells us. God didn't give us the spirit of fear. We needed godly courage. And we noticed that he was given the resourcefulness of courage personally, verse 5. It says also he strengthened himself. You know, God's leaders, God's called men need to be courageous. You know, it doesn't matter whether we go through Moses, Moses to Joshua, it doesn't matter where we go in and be of good courage. Because if the Lord called, calls lambs, there was one lamb full of courage, but that was the Lord Jesus Christ. But now the Lord is not calling lambs to lead his people because these are difficult times. And my friends, whether you, you're a leader of your home, a leader of your family, a leader of Christian groups, men, you need to take courage. And if your arms are weak and feeble, even like Moses, then you need, you need an arrow to come and help lift those arms around you. Take counsel from those around you, but you must strengthen yourself personally. Maybe, maybe you have a family, maybe you have young children or teenage children. Maybe they're getting assaulted and assailed from every side for their faith. They need to see that you have strengthened yourself in the faith, that you're a strong Bible-believing Christian, that you stand on the Word of God and you stand in the power of God and you are led by the Spirit of God. You must strengthen yourself. How much easier is it to do that when you're revived personally? You're right with the Lord. Sin isn't overwhelming you in your life. Everything is going right. You've got some personal revival. How much easier is it to strengthen yourself in the Lord, in the Lord when you're right with the Lord? It's so much more different. And we never know when these oppositions are going, all was going well, all was going well. And we opened up with the text, and after these things, boom, there they were. When everything was going so well in the land. Friends, we can start to drift off to sleep. We can be a bit of lukewarm layer of sins when things are at ease in Zion. But we must work hard to make sure we strengthen ourselves and take counsel and keep good company, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, that's where we gain that courage, that counsel, that confidence in the Lord, the word of God, and gathering with God's people. Resourcefulness he was given was courage personally, but also then that resulted in courage collectively. Verse 6 and 8, we just read them, but he sets captains of war over the people. He takes the mighty men of valor and, and subdivides the people. Therefore, they're able to see we have good leadership. We have strong spiritual leadership. The people are revived. The priests are revived. The king is revived. The leaders are revived and collectively. Collectively, they are strengthened. Collectively, they have courage. Now, there are many incredible Christians throughout the 2,000 years of church history who have had such incredible courage while they've been isolated, while they've been on their own. 
And you always pray that God would do that for any of us if we found ourselves in that position. But, you know, it's so much better to, to strengthen ourselves that when we gather together, doesn't that rub off? When, when, when you gather, when you, when you go through the week and you, you're preparing yourself, you're trying to revive your life. You're praying. You're getting into the Word of God. You're slinging out the things that cause sin and misthought. You're getting them out of the way. You're getting right with God. You're getting revived through the week. You come to church on a Sunday. You're full of the Spirit. You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're loving the Word of God. You're singing praises to God. And the whole point being that one person next to you, behind you, or in front of you, is just about managed to claw themselves into church, hanging on by their fingernails, and they come in. And they're strengthened by their brothers and sisters around them. That's the resourcefulness God gives us because of personal and collective revival. But not only is it counsel, courage, but look at verse 8, contentment. This is where contentment comes in the midst of trial, in the midst of, I can't even describe to you what they must have thought as they looked out and saw these armies of Syria, which were, as we know, the northern uh, uh, kingdom of Israel had been taken captivity into Syria. Judah looked out and Hezekiah looked out. Now, they would have known all this. They were strengthened personally. They were strengthened collectively. And there was contentment. Look with me at verse number eight. Well, let's read verse seven. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed. Why did he say that? Because that would be the natural position, to be afraid or dismayed. You know, the wonderful thing about the word of God is it doesn't ignore the reality of life. It's like if you look out there, the natural thing is we've had it. We're toast. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid. Not this made for the king of Assyria. Don't, don't, don't worry about him. Don't worry about Sennacherib. He may have taken those ten tribes of the north, captivity. He may lay in siege to the Kish and all the others. Don't worry about the fact there's an overwhelming and opposing number that, 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 that makes us look like such a minority. Be strong and courageous. Be afraid, nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. This was an overwhelming army. Why? For there be more with us than with him. Now, now, can you just imagine the soldiers on the wall? And Hezekiah, be strong, be courageous. And they're looking out. And this army's like ants before them, like locusts devouring the land. And then the king says, don't worry about it. There's more of us than him. And you're a soldier on the wall with your spear and your, spear and your shield at the ready. And you look around and you go, no, there isn't. No, there isn't. We're about 10% of their army if we're, if we're that. But look what he says in verse number eight. With him is an arm of flesh. He's got men and he's got godless men and that's all he's got. They are called men of valor. They were strong. Don't, don't think he came up with an army of ladies and lady boys and pansies. No, 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 no. Sennacherib had an army of strong, courageous soldiers of valor. They called that in the scripture. It wasn't they looked out and went, well, they're all four stone wimps and, and, and you know, some of them are kids. We, we can freaking beat them easy, even though there's far more than them. No, no. Hezekiah says, with him is an arm of flesh. All he's got is what's on the ground. All he's got is the best of men. The best of men are still the worst of sinners. That's all they are. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Now look at the contentment here. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. I mean, you can picture them. These would have been a knock a little bit. Experienced soldiers, they, listen, when they go into battle, they need that nervousness. The says the people rested themselves. The words of Hezekiah said it doesn't matter how many of them are on that side. It doesn't matter how many come wave after wave in opposition. It doesn't matter how much reinforcements they've got. It doesn't matter the strength of that godless nation because one with God is a majority, as John Knox said. And the people rested themselves to cancel. Encourage, there was contentment. 
because they looked to their God. Friends, we would do well to remember that in this day. Because the armies of Satan are opposed. The children of disobedience are a multitude of number. And you and I were once one of that army before we got saved. They are multitudes in their number and they are coming against God's people. You only have to look at what's going on in our nation and the kind of laws that are being passed any given way. The word of God wants to be gotten rid of. Uh, they, they want it so that people can't go out there and preach things out of the word of God, teach things out of the word of God and speak things out of the word of God and we are as grasshoppers in their sight but their flesh we have our God to fight our battles hey, go with me to Exodus uh, Exodus 14 just a couple of verses that might be an encouragement to you at times of trial and difficulty do what he can for personal revival every given day every day of the week do what he can to stay right with the Lord because the closer you stay with the Lord Lord, the more you trust the Lord. And then these verses will have meaning to you at times of great trial. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Now that is one of the hardest things to do in practice, isn't it? Wonderful verse to read, easy to memorize. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall keep your peace. Uh, until the trial comes, and I'm going to get my side in. Blah, 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 blah. No. So this is a terrible situation. Yeah. So it was for his car. God has allowed it. The Lord shall fight for you. Go with me. <coughs> I'm assuming there's a reason I've got that in my Bible. Proverbs 20, verse number 22. Ah, yes. Say not now, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save you. So, what does that mean? Go try and get your own back. We've always got to make sure we put our side and then we can go, well, whether they liked it or not, I came out on top. No, the Lord shall fight for you. He shall hold you this. One more, Romans 12. Romans 12. These are practical, everyday verses to help us get victory over our own flesh. Romans 12 and verse number 17, I think I want to. Yes. Romans 12, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Again, easy verses to read. These are hard verses to put into practice in our life, aren't they? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. It's not always possible, but as much as you can. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Let it go. Let it go best. For it is written here, it is again, vengeance is mine. I will work and say, the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, shoot him. <laughs> oh, it doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? If thine enemy hunger, feed him. Feed him. Make him stronger. Well, that, that's a good strategy of war. Obviously, God didn't read Sun Tzu's art of war, did he? But God knows what he's talking about. And he says to us, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. That was a military strategy. That's nuts. As God's word, it's absolute truth. And you know it's truth whether we agree with it or not, right? It's God's word and it's still truth and it doesn't fit with us. It's still truth. And God still expects us to have his word as the final authority in our life. Not one of the authorities, the final authority in his life. Feed him if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt what? He calls a fire on his head. God wants us to do the unexpected not to do what everybody else does. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, this is what Hezekiah was saying to the people and to the armies and to the mighty men of valor. Stand in the Lord, trust in the Lord, God's on our side, they're only men. It will be 
as God wants us to be. We're ready for the battle, but God is on our side. Resourcefulness. But then we find that there was a time of removal, secondly. Back to Second Chronicles 32. And, and, and removal was tantamount to the revival. Look with me at Second Chronicles 32, verse 11 and 12. So now we've got the, the, the taunting words coming. From uh, Sennacherib's servants. Look at verse 11 and 12 of Second Chronicles 32. Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Hath not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, You shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it. Do you know what they're saying? Hasn't Hezekiah taken away your safety nets? Hasn't Hezekiah taken away your lucky charms? Hasn't Hezekiah taken every single thing upon which you would stand? Hasn't he taken it away from you and said there's only one altar? There's only one way? There's only one chance. Now, what was he saying? He's saying to the people as a military strategist putting forth his propaganda, you don't have any avenues. Hezekiah, your king, you think he's a good guy, but he's narrowed you down to the narrow way. Ever heard anything like that before, Christian? Well, I like to keep my options wide open, broad. How many times as a Christian are you putting your faith in the world's resources, in the world's ways, in the world's methods, in the world's people? You're keeping your options open in case the God thing doesn't work. You see, this servant of Sennacherib was telling the truth, and it was a wonderful truth. You narrowed down, you're hemmed in. All you can do is trust in your God, and you've only got one. Amen. Because when your God is the right God, you only need one. Amen. You don't need a bunch of statues, lucky charms, and all the rest of it. Little little touch me, rub me, Jesus on crucifixes, swinging around on the car and around the neck and all the rest of it. You need your trust and faith in the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, isn't that what the world says to us as Christians? You need to have a broader, more tolerant approach now. You know there's more religions in the world than just yours, don't you know? No, there isn't. Not that work. Not that are true. And that's what he's saying. Don't you know out there there's far more religions and little gods with a G? And you've let Hezekiah hem you in down to just one. Yes, the God of all creation, almighty God. Thank you very much. In him will I put my trust. You see, removal, or sorry, revival in the right things will bring removal of the wrong things. We won't be trusting in rubbish and pseudosciences like psychology and psychiatry and all this invented nonsense. We'll trust in the Lord our God. You know, we've got a nation that takes a broad approach that's on the broad way, and never have we had more medicated, mutilated children in this land than we have now. Yet you Christians, you're so narrow, you're so intolerant, you Bible bashers, you fanatics. What does God say? This is your reasonable service. Put yourself on the altar, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This is your reasonable, not fanatical, service. Get rid of the rubbish. You see, uh, removal of the rubbish <coughs> is what brings revival. And, and, and really what we need to do is get rid of the superfluous. Get rid of the additional things that we just don't need, particularly things that we put trust in over and above our God. 
Get rid of the superfluous, get rid of the substitutionary, the idolatry. This, this is where this revival came from. The groves were broken down. The high places were broken down. The little Rubmus and Christophers were burnt and melted in the fire. The little pat, the little Buddha belly was melted in the fire. The little let me kiss the top of Mary was smashed to pieces and ground into dust. All the rubbish was gotten rid of. So it was the nation, the princes, the priests, the king. I trust in God and God alone. Now that is where revival comes from. See, very often the, 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 the people think the method to revival is to add more in, add more in, add more in. No, it's to get more out of our lives. Get more of the junk the superfluous, the superstitious, and the substitutionary, throw it out, and then we get revival because then we've got focus and concentration. Chapter 13, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 13. <clears throat> and verse number 8. I'll be 8 and 9. Proverbs 30, verse 8. Remove far from me. Vanity and lies. Now, vanity has got nothing to do with Vanity Fair or Cosmopolitan magazine. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, things that make you look better. It's empty, vapid, vaporous, useless things. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Because this world is full of vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. That's the position for a Christian. You know, some have that this misguided thing. Well, you know, I need to be crawling around, crawling in the dust, scrabbling around, you know, living poor for, for Jesus with, with, with nothing. Now, you can be poor for Jesus, right? Poor people get saved. Nothing wrong with that. But what it's saying is don't, don't seek to be scrabbling in the dust. Don't, 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 don't seek to get rid of what God wants you to use. But also, don't have the love of money, which is the what? Root of all evil. The root of all evil. The question is centered on the dead center of biblical truth, right? Thankful for what gives us, God gives us because we can use it. And this is important. So the substitution with the superfluous, we should ask the Lord to show us what things in our life, Lord, what's getting in the way? What's getting in the way of me following you more closely? What's getting in the way of me trusting you more heartily? What things would you have me to remove from my life? Because as the servant of Sennacherib uh, said, you shall worship before one altar. We know what the world say. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And in many phases of life, that, that's good advice, right? But God says, in him, put all your eggs in one basket. It's not God and. It's God. It's not Christ and. It's Christ. God says, put all your trust and faith in him. Not him and. It's like salvation, isn't it? It's by grace through faith. That's how we say it, by grace through faith, not of worse, like any man should boast. Not, not, not Christ and water, not Christ and a wafer, not Christ and anything, not Christ and works, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Trust in nothing more and nothing less than his death and his burial and his resurrection. That's the gospel. And sometimes you have to remove, as Hezekiah did, he removed all that was superfluous, superstitious, and idolatrous. The revival came, the people got their sight fixed on God, and when the trial and the trouble and the tribulation came, and the, the servant of Sennacherib said, you've only got one altar, you've only got one God, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That works for me. Can't keep up with all them saints and who's supposed to find your lost Jews and everything anyway. Right? There's millions of them. <coughs> so revival gave them resourcefulness. Revival gave them the chance to remove the things that were superfluous and substitutionary. And prepared them for the railing that was to come in verses 13 to 19. Again, Second Chronicles 32. I'm moving on for the sake of time tonight. So much more could be said. Verse 13 of Second Chronicles 32. Now here's 
what is being said to challenge the people, God's people. Know ye not what I and my fathers have done <clears throat> and to all the people of other lands were the gods, now note the small g there, okay, you've got to get your small g's and your big g's here, were the gods of the nations of those lands any ways able to deliver their lands out of mine hand? What use were they? Who was there among all the gods of those, those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of mine hand, that your God, capital G, should be able to deliver you out of mine hand? All those gods, all those multiplicities of false gods did absolutely nothing but all those lands historically. Nothing. It didn't matter if they got a gargoyle, a demon, a Buddha, a Mary, any one of the myriad of so-called saints. It didn't matter. He said, we worked through those lands. And, and they had a myriad of false gods. And you people are going to put your trust in just one? He's like, you're crazy. Anybody ever been called crazy for putting all your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Anybody ever felt like you were sometimes? Sometimes, wow, yeah, you know. In the cold light of day when I analyze it, if I think about it, it is a bit crazy. Right? It is a bit, wow, I'm putting my, my whole trust, my whole faith for the forgiveness of all of my sins, for my sealing, for my security, for my hope for all eternity in the death and the burial and the resurrection of God the Son, the Son of God, who came from heaven to earth, lived among us 33 years, and then let them crucify and was put in the tomb, buried, and rose again. It's incredible, isn't it? So incredible, only God could do it. And that's why we put our trust and faith in it. It's wonderful. But the people rail. Now, what, 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 do, you, what, what do I mean by that? Let, let, let's carry on through the verses here. Verse number 15. Now, therefore, let not Hezekiah deceive you. You know what it's like when you get those fanatical cult leaders. He's going to play roulette with all of your lives here on the wall. He's telling you, worry about the overwhelming numbers against us. He's leading you as the king, saying, put all your trust in one God, and you're totally overwhelmed and outnumbered. The guy's a fanatic. He's telling you to trust the word of God and nothing more. Listen, you guys are nuts. He's deceiving you. I've heard that. I've been called a cult leader more than once. They've obviously never been here. All the cults I've ever come across have got loads of people in them. Right? It'd be amazing to be a cult leader, right? You know, all these people who do what you say. I don't get anybody to do what I say, right? Cult leader would be a step up, it seems like. Now, therefore, let not Hezekiah deceive you, verse 15, nor persuade you on this matter, neither yet believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of mine hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of mine hand? And his servants spake yet more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affright them and to trouble them that they might take the city. And they spake against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of man. Railing, what does that mean? To revile, to scold in harsh language, if you will. To be insolent or abusive. Here's the servants of Sennacherib railing against God's people, railing against Hezekiah. You're all nuts for following that guy. He's going to get you all killed. He's got you all putting your faith and trust in God's word. Only one way, only one God. Do you know how many lands we've been through? Do you know how many multitudes of people were trusting in their little wheat gods and their food gods and all their other gods and their astra and their astra? And we've wiped them all out. And you think just this one God. You people are nuts for believing this guy. Let him die on his own. He's deceiving you. Let him stand in the faith of his one God. And that's what it means by railing. You ever been criticised being a Bible believer? 
Well, Christianity's all right, but you're taking it a little bit far, aren't you? The Bible, you know, it's got some useful little proverbs and things, little words of wisdom. I'm sure God's thoughts are in there somewhere. But I mean, you're just taking it too literally. I mean, you don't really believe it means what it says and you're supposed to do what it says. Where'd you get that from? Well, our pastor preaches that. Don't be deceived by that lunatic. That's what they're saying on a national level. You ever heard that? You go on the streets, you tell someone you come to this church, and then you see what they say. It's a cult. Why do they do that? To create doubt. You people should doubt, don't you? Don't you fall for that one God, one word nonsense? Don't you fall for that? There's diversity out there in the world. Your God isn't the only God. And all those gods, none of them stood up to our God yet. Derision. Derision. You're ridiculous. You ever been across somebody who's tried to make you feel so juvenile, immature, with no intelligence whatsoever, because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? You are ridiculous. This is the 21st century. We've developed AI, and you're trusted in a stupid old book. What's the matter with you? You crazy? You must have been deceived. Listen, uh, did, when you got saved, did you ever have that? If, you, if the rest of your family weren't saved, they go to rescue mode. Well, no, rescue mode comes after they'll go out of it. Give them a couple of weeks. And then you start getting worse, like the Bible group. You start trying to give them the gospel. You start changing your life. Then they go into a rescue mode. They try and put some doubt on there. They try and rescue you. You've been deceived. It's not your fault. You're just a little bit stupid for making your own decisions. I mean, I know you're 25, 30, 55, but really, you've never really grown up. Listen to us. And we see the discourse uh, there in verse 16 and 17. His servant spake yet more against the Lord God. Verse 17, he wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel. Isn't that where we find today? The discourses that come against Christ and Christians, they're verbal, they're spoken, they're written, they're broadcast everywhere you go. I mean, that superfluous and national kind of religious nonsense is all right, you know. The, the men in the frocks with the sticks. But we don't stand against anything. We don't stand for something. We do as anybody tells us. And whatever the world wants, that's what we'll do in our church. Well, that's kind of how that goes. And then they call it Christianity. It's a disgrace. An utter disgrace. And it's such a disgrace because not only does it lead people to hell and lead them to think that that, that pathetic nonsense is the truth, what it does is it makes people who've got the truth sets everybody against them because now if you stand for the truth, you're some kind of strange Christian. You're probably not even a real Christian. And they believe the truth is a lie. It doesn't matter whether they speak it, broadcast it, or write it. There is a wave against true biblical Christianity that doesn't stop. And to be quite honest with you, some of the worst people I've ever met for that are those that profess to be Christians that would never know one side of Christ from another, wouldn't know the word of God from the newspaper. But we do nice things. Wonderful, brilliant. Nice people go to hell. Hell is filled with nice people. Hell is filled with nice people who thought they were Christians because they were born on this country or went to church every Sunday. I could sit in my garage every Sunday, but it wouldn't make me a car. Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian. You need to be born again. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. That's how you become a Christian, and that's the only way you become a Christian. You see, what did they use against Hezekiah and his people? An, an, An onslaught of propaganda, nudge. We heard a lot about that, didn't we, over COVID? Manipulation. What were they using? Fear as the foundation. You must be crazy. Nobody believes that. There's only a few of you. Take a look around your own church. Surely, surely that should give you a clue. 
You believe what? That book? Are you crazy? Are you nuts? It's going to be illegal soon anyway. <clears throat> of course it is. Legal to murder babies. I mean, why wouldn't it be illegal to have the word of God? Railing. If you ever faced it, railing, opposition, insult, doubt, deception. But it ends the way it always ends with the Lord. There was a result. The advantage was with the workers of Satan. The advantage was with the deceived. God's people in the minority. God's people trusting in one God and a narrow way. God's people, no resources outside their trust in God, and they stood in their faith. How did it go for them? Well, Thankfully, in line with them, look at verse 20. It says, and for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. What cause? They were mocking God. And that because Hezekiah was revived, he said, there's a cause. They will not mock our God. They can insult me all they like, but they, it says here, his servants spake yet more against the Lord God. They wrote letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and for this cause. God's people took a stand and for God. Isn't that novel? It was a cause. And there was a cry. They prayed and cried to heaven. When was the last time you got on your face for Christ? Because of the nonsense that is spoken against our God. And you cried out to God, not because you were affected and afflicted, because God was mocked and ridiculed and reviled. When there was, was there not a cause? When was the last time you prayed for the Lord because of this land and their mockery, reviling and rejection of the true Christ of the Bible? Is there not a cause? It was a cause and a cry. And God answered the prayer. Verse 21, there was an evacuation, and it was swift. And the Lord sent an angel, just the one. We see, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God. God hears the cry of his people. He takes a look down at the multitudes of the thousands upon thousands of the Syrians. Now, it doesn't say which angel it is. Could be the angel of the Lord. Could be the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, the, the archangel Michael has a particular a particular work in protection of the nation of Israel. So it could have been the archangel. And you, you could just picture God. Say, yeah, I've, 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 now, let me stand away from the Bible, right? This is just me being a little bit irreverent. This is in Scripture, right? And you can just picture God. So I've heard the cry of Hezekiah. I've heard the cry of Isaiah. I've taken a look down. There's about 200,000 in the army. Uh, Michael, go and sort that, will you? <laughs> You'll be back before lunch. We'll have some angel manner for lunch. <laughs> now, I hope that's not irreverent, but that's all it is to God. Man, what are we like? What am I going to do? Nobody likes me. They all think I'm crazy. They think I'm nuts. They think I'm stupid. They, they think I've got no sense. I'm trusting in Jesus. I believe the Bible. God, what am I going to do? I'm trusting in you. Dealt with you. Verse 21, the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of Allah. Uh, and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. There was a swift withdrawal and evacuation. But God didn't end it there. There was a, then an assassination. Look at the rest of verse 21. And when he was come into, the is Sennacherib, come into the house of his God, not the small G, you know, getting down for his little statue carved by man's hands. How in, I don't know how many times a day. They that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with a the sword. His own sons killed him. He looked all over. He cried to God. God intervened. Problem solved. So what? How would you get such a result? Revival. Revival. Put in absolute faith and trust. In God. There was a cause, there was a cry, there was evacuation, there was an assassination. And lastly, as we finish tonight, there was magnification. 
of our great God. Look at it there. The Lord sent an angel, verse 21. We've looked at that. Look at verse 22. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other, and guided them on every side. God was glorified. Many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from henceforth. From thenceforth. You, you may say, well, that's Hezekiah that was magnified. Why was Hezekiah magnified? Because his God was magnified. Because they knew every man wanted to be a friend of the man who was the friend of God. God was glorified. Hezekiah, God just allowed Hezekiah to get some, some notification that it is God. of his God because of the truth of his God. The Lord always had the last word. We got a lot of words being spoken against God's people, but look how this ends. Verse 19, and they spake against. Verse 20, and for this cause. Verse 21, and God sent an angel. Verse 22, thus the conclusion. God. This is going on, that's going on, everything looks bad. What are we going to do? Cry out to God. God has the last word. God always has the last word, and God will have the last word. It doesn't matter what this world says. God's word is true, and every man be alive. You think God created this world? You're foolish. Not as foolish as you for not believing that everything that's made has made. You think your sins are forgiven? There's no such thing as sin. Yeah, well, you're foolish. Well, I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in any God. I believe I am the master of my own destiny. Yep, and you're foolish as well, because there will be a thus saith. Because Jesus Christ is coming again. That's foolish. No, it's not. That's going to happen. And, 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 thus the Lord. That's what it always ends in. Man thinks this, man thinks the other. But God still just does what he said he's going to do. Friends, revival will get you through trial. And I know that everybody talks about not the Welsh revival. No. You just let the Lord revive you. And God will bring you through your trial. Eventually. <coughs> Whatever it is. Because God is with you. Christ is your Lord. Savior. May the Lord help us to desire personal revival because that will get us through the trial. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the word of truth. We thank you for the truth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that while the world will mark and the world will scoff and the world will revile and the world will reject, Lord, we thank you that we believe the foolishness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our Heavenly Father, we stand in days and times as the, the armies amass against our God. And Father, that is purely because we are those who are seen for Christ. We, 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 we pray for Christians up and down this land and around the world to stand firm because the arm of flesh will fail us. But God is on our side because we are on the side of God. Who is on the Lord's side? That's the question Moses asked. Well, God, I pray tonight that you find a people that were on your side and we've narrowed it down and we're on the straight and narrow way. God, bring, I pray, revival to us. Strengthen us individually. Strengthen us as a church. Strengthen us that having done all to stand, we may stand. Therefore, for the cause of the glorious gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ. God help us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.